We're live. Um, I always want to do like the boxing or UFC. Like we are live. I don't know why it's like in my head. Um, so welcome back everyone to my series where I'm able to talk to different fans about their teams and get all the inside information that I can. Um, I have JJ on the show today and I just want to say <laughs> that whenever I decided I wanted to do this, I knew it was going to be hard because I was going to have to put myself out there and talk and try to reach out to people that like have no idea who I am. And I totally realize it's kind of weird. However, what I decided to do is I made a list of the teams that I am most intrigued by based on the people that UT got players for. And so I thought if I at least could make a connection on those teams, it would help me like work through my list. Um, and so that's what I did. And so I actually stumbled across your profile um, because your profile picture, I was like, is he in the blue man group? <laughs> and, so, and so I clicked on it because mind you, like I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm all organized and I'm writing down things and I'm like, okay, I need the Panthers. And I'm saying these things out loud and you know how our phones do, they naturally are listening to you. And I yeah. kid you not, the next time I went on Twitter, I saw a blue man group profile picture and I was <laughs> like, oh, this is so cool. And then I obviously clicked on it and saw who you were. And I thought, oh my gosh, if he responds to me. If he doesn't think I'm like a, you know, weirdo troll, like on social media, like randomly be like, Hey, do you want to come talk to me about your team? Um, so anyways, so I jumped in your DMS and I was like, do you want to collaborate with me? And I was like, please. Um, so I'm super excited that you're here, that you showed up, that you're excited about your Panthers. Um, since then I've obviously been like watching your content and just like I'm obsessed with fandom um, in the sense that I love watching how different people are fans to their respective team organization. Some people are player fans. Some people mm -hmm. are program fans. Some people are organizational fans. Some people love the coaches. So it's always interesting to me to understand like different people's of different fandoms. So that is my whole spiel and introduction. I will stop talking. This is about your Panthers. So if you would like to just introduce yourself, let us know a little bit about you, whatever you want to tell us. And then we would love to know what, how you became a fan. Like, how did you decide the Panthers were going to be your team and you were going all in with them? <laughs> that's a, that's a, a very crazy story, but I'll try to keep it as concise as possible. Uh, first of all, my name is JJ Hardy. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I run a Twitter uh, page called Panthers Culture, but also a website, um, you know, where it was supposed to be a blog, um, honestly. And um, so just to go back in time a little bit, I've been a football fan my whole life, right? And, and honestly, I'm older than the Panthers. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so the Panthers are coming up on about 29 years old. Um, you know, they began in 1995, but I was already watching NFL football, college football, all that already. And so um, I actually grew up a 49ers fan, a San Francisco mm, okay. 49ers fan. I'm from South Carolina. Uh, we didn't have a team in the Carolinas when I when I was a young boy. And so, um, so I grew up watching Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, you know, that's one of my family names um, is Rice. And so, uh, so I, I my grandma told me that he was my cousin, you know, just playing around and and I became a fan of Jerry Rice and, and you know, and the rest was history. I was uh, red and gold, you know, for years. And then in 1995, um, the Carolina Panthers were born and um, the, the team, the Carolina Panthers, they're based in Charlotte, North Carolina, is about an hour from where I grew up in South Carolina. And so uh, when the Panthers were born. Um, they play exhibition games in South Carolina. Their first season, their inaugural season, was actually played at um, Clemson Memorial oh, okay. um, in Clemson. Um, so a lot of ties to upstate South Carolina. I, I would say that I became a fan in 1995, but really it was just a home team. It was something that we had never experienced. Uh, it was a brand new team. And, uh, and so, you know, we were kind of just watching to see how that would go. Uh, but the 49ers were still very good in 1995, mm -hmm. right? You know, yeah. it was Steve Young. And, and so we had, you know, 49ers had just won the Super Bowl. And, you know, so, and it was so ironic because back then, geographics didn't really matter much when it came to like where they placed teams in, in divisions. And so they placed Carolina in the NFC West with oh, really? the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, like in the beginning, the, the Carolina Panthers were in the same division with the 49ers. 
Right? Huh. Okay. And so I remember telling my cousins and everybody, like, I'm going to become a Panthers fan. Uh, you know, and I was, I was just, you know, root for the 49ers. But, you know, it was hard to really stick to that because we played them twice, right? So teams played each other twice. And so um, I just decided, you know, that the 49ers were going to be my team. The Panthers would be my home team. I would root mm -hmm. for them both. And I didn't care who won when they played each other, right? Because I couldn't lose that game. And so it was that way for years. Uh, you know, I went to the military. And when you're in the military, you know, you really don't care, you know, fighting is from and everything because you, you're displaced. And so um, the 49ers were good some years. The, Pan the Panthers were good some years when the Panthers were good. And I was happy that, you know, they made it to the playoffs. I was with them. And same thing with the 49ers. Fast forward to 2016, and this is where the story gets interesting. Um, in 2016, I'm watching preseason football, and um, the crazy part is the Carolina Panthers had just gone to the Super Bowl and lost to Denver. But they had just come off a really great season. Cam Newton was on top of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 49 land, um, preseason football, I remember watching, you know, Colin Kaepernick was, you know, he was trying to get back right, you know, from being out. And then I remember waking up one morning and um, all the news from the from San Francisco was about him, him kneeling. Nick Nick. And I was like, oh, my God, I my first my first reaction was like, that's weird. You know, I'm a military vet. You know, I'm like, why would he be sitting? No, he wasn't kneeling yet. He sat. That was oh, the on the one. bench. That was the first. He yeah, sat, you're right. He you're sat right. on the bench. He sat on the bench. And so um, and everybody was talking about it, you know, and I was like oh my God, like I just was hoping that he can like get back on the field. And then now they're talking about this, like, why would he do that? And I remember like just trying to find like, you know, just football stuff, you know, just mm -hmm. see what people were saying, not necessarily about it, but just about the team. And there was so much negativity uh, being written at the time about Colin. And I was like, he's not that bad of a dude, you know, and then the why came out and you no, know, that was a tumultuous summer, you know, especially mm -hmm. in the black community. And you know when the why came out, I was like, okay, I kind of, I kind of get why. I respect it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I respect this, you know. And I was like, even as a military vet, you know, I was born a black man, and so mm -hmm. what he's saying speaks to me because what he's talking about bothered me, and it and it and it was bothering me at that point in time. And uh, and I remember just trying to reason with fans during that time as a 49er fan, but. The fans, you know, in that fan base, I wouldn't say I won't say all of them were negative, but the majority of them were super negative, even to me, trying to come off as a veteran um, who, who's gone to war, you know, for this country, yeah. who served and carried, you know, and stand up for the, the anthem every time it is played anywhere I'm at. And I'm trying to reason with football fans about, you know, like why Colin was doing what he was doing. And I got, you know, really, you know, just bombarded with negativity you know mm -hmm. some of the most awful things were said to me and i wasn't even the main character in the situation i was just yeah. trying to be a, a common fan <laughs> right. and i really felt super weird you know being in that that space during that time because of all the rhetoric that was going on and all the vitriol that was being spewed towards him but also to the fans who 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 understood where he was coming mm -hmm. from i felt like we got kind of lost in in that um in that situation because everything was so aggressive um towards him and against him and and as you all you know anybody who was paying attention they would see that um that was his last year playing football um you know we yep. went into 2017 49ers had a new regime you know with the shanahan and, and john lynch combo and you know the one of the first things they did was you know they addressed the quarterback situation they basically told him um, we're going to cut you. And if we if you don't um, want to be cut, you can you can basically uh, request your release. Right. Or something to that effect. And that's what he did. Um, it was kind of spun a different way um, and during that time. And it was just hard to navigate during that time. You know, obviously, um, you know, it started with Colin, the Nets offseason, um, Eric Reed, you know, who was kneeling with him during mm -hmm. the 2016 season. Um, he wanted to go back to San Francisco after his contract was up. Um, they did not, you know, want to bring him back. 
um, despite, you know, what people may say, you know, they didn't want to bring him back. They traded away the third guy, Eli Harrell. And all of a sudden in one season, the three guys who were stood kneeling, for something. Yep. Yeah, they stood for something. They were gone. And I remember, you know, trying to just being a normal football fan, I was trying to navigate how to feel about uh, being a fan and and like and and I guess aligning myself with the, all the people who were saying all the negative things um, during that time. And I found it very hard. And I got to the point where I was I was basically um, boycotting the NFL. I and did so, too. Yeah, and so I, I boycotted. Um, you know, the NFL and a lot of people don't know that because I so much and I spend so much time, you know, with football now. Yeah. You know, but that was a very trying season for me. I started writing. Um, you know, someone asked me to start writing for NBA basketball because I was so focused on basketball all of a sudden. Somebody saw me on Twitter on my original um handle, you know, and uh, and they were like, you know, man, you know, we really like your takes on NBA basketball. Can you write for our little small company? I won't mention the company's name. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. They was like, well, first of all, like, you know, we seen your football takes too. Are you cool with that too? Like, and I was like, <laughs> nah. I said, I can't focus on football right now because I'm not yeah. watching. And, um, and so I was doing the whole NBA thing and it was cool. You know, like every time something happened, like I would get up and start writing an article on it. Like it was crazy being in that little, um, that little situation, you know, being in the bullpen waiting to to get out and write an article on a on a, like some breaking news in, in the That's NBA. That's so funny. I love that yeah, actually. Yeah, and so I was doing it, and I was like, you know, and I built like a little following, uh, primarily on Facebook, and people was like, "Man, you really good at this." People that knew me for years didn't know I I had a penchant for doing that type of thing. Okay, and That's it was cool. like, you know, you should they say you should build your own, um, your own little you know company or whatever you know to talk about. You know, talk about ball but again i was so focused on the nba you know because i wasn't watching football and then and i think it was like september um or october of 2018 i was at lunch <laughs> at my real job at the pan job <laughs> and i saw a tweet pop up saying that the carolina panthers had signed eric reed and ah. i was like oh my god i was like the panthers like carolina like hey look <laughs> My team that's lived, that's yeah, like yeah, right here. Yeah. I, said, I, said that, I said, that's the home team. I was like, I don't know why they would have done that in, in Carolina of all places because mm -hmm. that's if, you, true. if you're from there, then you would know that, you know, that that's a very conservative part of the country, right? Especially compared to San Francisco. Yeah, especially yeah. compared to San Francisco and so to think that they would be the ones that would sign Eric Reed or Colin Kaepernick or anybody who had been seen protesting. I was like, I don't know how that's going to be received, but you know what? I'm all for it. So I started like looking you know, for like all the contests behind it. You know, they had this new owner, Dave Tepper, and who didn't mind, you know, shaking things up. And I was like, wow, like like, this cat is crazy, but I'm with it. You know, so I get to watch football again. And so, at first, I felt torn. I was like, I think I'm going to, to you know, <laughs> like, like start watching football again. I guess I'm a 49ers fan, but I won't pay attention to them. You know, I'll just, you know, pay more attention to Carolina. And then, you know, and, and all the, the fans that I, I was cool with, because I was cool with some of the 49ers fans, I tried to let them know. And, you know, just like football, they were, they were so mad, you know, like. Of course. We're mad please. at everything. Uh, you know, like, you know, you didn't want to be here anyway. And I was like, look, yeah. dude, you know, like, it ain't that deep, but I get it. You know what I'm saying? Because it's football. But I was like, it's real easy for me to go home to Carolina because that's really where I'm from. I had been to San Francisco um, to go to Candlestick and, you know, to experience the whole 49ers thing. And although that was a great experience, saw them win, you know, seeing the old Candlestick part, I never felt like I was part of that fan base when even being there because okay. I just couldn't see myself in it. Right. Okay. Now I'm back in Carolina. I had also been to Charlotte, you know, to go to games when I was in Charlotte, I always felt like these are my people. And mm. so now I have a real reason, you know, to support, you know, the Carolina Panthers. And in 2018, that's when I made the full shift, you know, okay. from being a 49ers fan and like a, Carolina home team fan too. I'm pouring all of my energy into the Carolina Panthers. But then I was so scared, you know, that 
this might be just like it was in San Francisco. Like, will the fan base be able to handle Eric Reed? You know, I, I felt like, you know, the minority voice, the black voice in particular, as it pertained to me, you know, was drowned out over the last few years. Uh, and so I want to shift this blogging that I'm doing to focus on talking about the Carolina Panthers. And although a lot of fans didn't want to talk about the intersection of politics and sports. Because nobody ever like, wants to. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I'm here for that. So I'll sit in silence until something controversial comes up and then I'll speak up or I'm gonna write an article. I'm gonna do it like that, right? Yeah. And um, and so I went, I went super hard, you know, like I went and I'm a, I, I like to draw and um and so I was like, I gotta design like a cool logo, you know, for my little Panthers culture, you know, um page or whatever, and uh, or my blog site. And so I worked with this Japanese artist. I started like researching all the things that mattered to the Carolinas, you know, in terms of like cultural things. And so the the logo you see now on my profile picture, that's actually an NFT, you know, that was like, you know, done oh, by like okay. Group, okay. Right? My and small so, brain. I'm like, is that the blue man group? Like that's no, no, the first no. thing I thought about. No, it was it's, it's it's like a I wanted him to do like a like a ninja, you know, with a with a like a Panther, Black Panther type thing. Yeah, so you know, like okay. I can see yeah. it now. I can see yeah, okay. Yeah. And so, but you know, but my original theme is a is an actual, um, like a Japanese art, you know, um, depicted panther, you know, but it has you know both um, state flags in the in the eyes of the panther, and okay. some really tribal um, markings or whatever to like distinguish one state from the other. Um, it's just a really cool piece of art that I put together, and once I put it together, people started asking for it, and so. I came out the gate, you know, with people asking me to put that onto t-shirts and sell apparel. And so I was selling apparel um, super heavy for like, maybe like the first year or so. And uh, and everybody became to know me as the guy who was pushing like dope gear for the Carolina Panthers. And you no, know, truth be told, I thought it was cool from the perspective of, you know, if I had just been boycotting, I was like, I don't want to like, you know, to to buy NFL licensed stuff. You yeah, know, you like, got to wear your own. Yeah, so I got to wear my own stuff, you know, yeah. to games and everywhere. But every time I wore it somewhere, people wanted to buy it. And so I was selling, you know, T-shirts and everything. And and that was cool. I wasn't making any real money. People thought I was getting rich. And they thought, you know, the haters was like, oh, you know, he's capitalizing on our fandom. Like, he's not a real oh, fan. Gosh. He just wants to make money off of it. And I was like, you guys really think it's actual money in T-shirts, man? Right. <laughs> And so, um, but like but you're regardless. selling millions and millions. Okay. Yeah, regardless, it, it was. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying though, you know, like the team was bad. Like as soon as the team, you know, like as soon as the playoff hopes were over, like nobody bought t-shirts. It was, it was <laughs> dumb, you know. Um, but the cool thing I did in year one, and I always remember this. Uh, if you follow the Panthers at all, Carolina uh, went through a transition in 2019. Cam Newton had gotten hurt. Um, early in the season, and um, Kyle Allen, you know, stepped in for for Cam Newton, but the star of the team was Christian McCaffrey, mm, and right, okay. he he had like a historic season. Um, he went for a thousand yards rushing, a thousand yards receiving, and um, and Cam Newton, you could tell that the energy was shifting. I knew people who were connected to the people in the building, and they were telling me, "Hey, look, man, they're moving on from Cam," and so. I was uh, in Atlanta. The Panthers came to Atlanta. I live here in Atlanta. And so I went downtown to go to the game and I met with like one of the um, the fan groups. And uh, and so we went to Cam Newton's um, cigar bar, his restaurant mm -hmm. and bar. And so I met with his brother and I asked his brother, I was like, man, what's going on with Cam, man? You know, like a lot of people saying that, you know, they probably ain't coming back or he may not want to come back. You know, the team saying that. And I'm hearing things, you know, about the team, you know, maybe moving on from him. And he was like, look, he said, if you got like any kind of platform, he said, you let the people up there know that Cam definitely wants to come back. Right. And I was like, how can I do that? Right. I was like, how can I convey this message to like at the time I probably had like maybe a thousand followers. Um, and so, so I was like, I got to start this conversation somehow. And I remember saying to fans one night, you know, when I got home, you know, from that game, I was like, uh, I said, if 
I said, I was I was watching basketball and I saw like the post of LeBron and Cleveland, right? And I was like, Cam Newton should have like a poster or a big, you know, mural or something on the side of the stadium at Charlotte, you know, like like yep. he's that big up there, you know, in yes. Carolina. <laughs> and um, and so it, you know, we started having that conversation on Twitter. It evolved into um, you know, this conversation around doing this billboard to keep Cam in Carolina. And so uh, I woke up um, the next morning with, and, and a lot of people don't know the story about how this happened. Um, I woke up with this this um, DM and, and Twitter, you know, from- <laughs> Good a, old a Twitter. Writer from, yeah, <laughs> I, wo- I woke up with a DM from Twitter from a, a writer by the name of Jordan Rodriguez. She now writes for the, the LA Rams. Uh, but she was saying that she had saw my tweet about doing a billboard for Cam, and she wanted to to include it in her notes, um, you know, for her article that she was writing uh, that 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 weekend. She was in Carolina at the time, and she posted it on the Athletic. People read it, and all of a sudden, I start getting like this overwhelming support for like this GoFundMe oh. to like to to do a to do this billboard for Cam Newton. And um and I got people who called me. It's like, man, why are you doing this? You know, they're gonna move on from him anyway. I was like, well, I can't really go wrong by doing it because even if they move on from him, he would know what the fans thought about him. That y'all right? love them. Yep. That that we love them. And mm-hmm. um and so um the message was conveyed. You know, all the proceeds that weren't spent on doing the um the billboards were um, given to his foundation. That's awesome. And, uh, and so it was just like a cool experience. Now, I, obviously, I got a lot of love for that. I got way more love than hate, but there were some haters too because uh, you know, always, people, yeah, always. it was so <laughs> crazy. And, and so, like when you talk about fandom and uh, just getting an understanding of like how fandom works and the psychology of it, I learned a lot. You know, during that that first season um, of having the Panthers culture page, you know, like it it quickly went from me thinking it would be a blog, you know, to people wanted at some points to just be like an outright movement fan club yeah. kind of type deal. And to, you know, like, I just wanted to keep it really organic. I even was asked to like grow it beyond the Carolina Panthers at some points by people. And I was like, nah, I just want to keep it right here. You know, yeah. I don't really, I don't really want to like, like dilute, you know, myself, you know, in terms of like what I'm passionate about. And so I've kept it, I kept it Panthers, you know, for the last, it's been five years now. So um, anyway, that was a long intro. Yeah. It, um, it but, was, you but you know what? It. Like, no, I, can I just like say something? I think you'll be okay if I say this. Before yeah. this, you were like, I, you know, I'm not, I don't really talk that much. I don't really have a lot <laughs> to say. And here you are like giving us like this history <laughs> and this background and I'm soaking yeah. it all up. I'm like, really? This is so no, that's, cool. That's, that's, that's the, that's the story though, you know, and it, and it's, it's cool because it's real. You know, yeah. I've, I've, I've also dealt with a lot of people who question my authenticity because I've also, I've always kept it real with the fact that I grew up a 49er fan. Right. And so, um, you know, and that, you know, that I kind of had, you know, both teams and followed both teams, you know, since 1995. And then I came on, you know, in 2019 and started this page. And so a lot of people, you know, who could have showed up out of nowhere could have just fronted and acted like, well, I've been here from the very beginning and never mentioned the other part, right? But I always felt like it was better to just be truthful um, because I think it adds to my authentic story. And like now I hate the 49ers. Like I hate how they're built. I'm like Kendrick Lamar and Drake. Like I, I hate the way that they dress. You know what I'm saying? Like I hate the coaches. I hate the players that they draft. You know what I'm saying? Like I really despise them more than anybody. Like I grew up hating the Cowboys. Like now I hate them. And like they they traded for Christian McCaffrey. I hate him too. You know yeah, what I'm saying? No. And so <laughs> it it doesn't matter. Like Kyle Shanahan sucks, John Lynch sucks. <laughs> and, um, and I want nothing more than to just get to a point to where the Panthers can just actually like embarrass them. And we're a long way from that, but right. that's where so, I well, to be. So, since you brought it up, let's go ahead and go there. L- let me know. Um, <laughs> So I feel like there's so much I want to ask here. So I, I'm just going to throw it all out there. So obviously I, I'm curious to know how you felt you all did in free agency. Um, 
curious to know favorite draft picks, what you thought about the draft, but I'm also very mm -hmm. curious to know how you all felt this season watching Bryce young without being dramatic, kind of run for his life <laughs> in certain yeah. situations. And, and really it seemed like he just didn't have a lot of options. He didn't have a lot of really anything um, around him to help him be successful. And then obviously the coach gets fired. Like there's so many things yeah. happening. So, yeah. so that's all of that's loaded. But if you want to touch on the, the free agency, how you, how you think you all went team last year in the draft, however you want to package it up for me. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts and just like what you're seeing, what you all are hearing um, and you know, how you feel a, a lot of, a lot of people right now are very happy because they have no reason not to be yet. Um, right. so I would love to know like how you all are feeling. So I'll start with free agency. Okay. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we, we came out the gate swinging in free agency, you know, by, um, addressing the offensive line, oh, right. Gosh. You know, as specifically the interior offensive line, you know, anybody who watched the Carolina Panthers last year. Uh, our right guard and left guard positions, and even the center position, or and the left tackle position. I was gonna say, oh yeah, yeah like like four of the five offensive linemen, like basically were serving as turnstiles um, for 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 pass rushers, and um, and that's a horrible way to to build around you know a a quarterback, a young quarterback, and particularly the smallest quarterback drafted in nfl history right is he, so, is he? Like, yeah i mean like i think in total stature um he's the same height as kyler murray you know at five foot ten okay that was gonna he, be my he, okay yeah he, he wasn't as heavy as kyler murray so you know pound for pound um inch for inch you know i think he's the smallest you know drafted in the modern era right Aww. and so um you know and, and it's crazy you know just to kind of give you a story that my son who's a sophomore in high school right now. Um, after we drafted Bryce, this was like last, you know, last spring, I guess. You know, my son at the time was five foot ten and like 155 pounds. <laughs> and, you know, he was talking about the, you know, the draft and you know what he thought about it and, you know, and, you know, just giving me some of his takes, you know, as he does. And he was like, Dad, like Bryce Young is the same size as me, you know. <laughs> and I was like, in the truck looking across at him in the passenger seat kind of slumped down i was like oh my god because i've been up on guys like brian burns and eater gross matos and you know some of these other nfl guys and i'm like i'm six foot tall and i feel small against those guys Derek brown mm. like and i'm thinking like i wouldn't even want to put my son at five foot ten on the same field with these guys no and it just gave me perspective of like the challenge that Bryce Young, you know, has to to face and overcome every time he steps onto a football field. Now, give that guy a porous offensive line, and then see how well he can perform with that. So, did you so the all fact know the we, offensive line was that bad before the season started? Um, no, you know, because it was a situation where last year, um, we had an offensive scheme that was built. To, to play power. Uh, to oh, run, to, I see. Okay. Yeah, to run a power scheme. So those guys were used to going forward. Um, and, you know, we did like a lot of play action off of that power scheme, that power run scheme in 2022. And so the offensive line graded out pretty well. You know, guys were doing things that they did naturally. Uh, uh, for example, you know, we had uh, our center, uh, you know, he had come from Baltimore. He had run power. You know, we had him in Carolina, uh, and he was running power. You know, here in Carolina, and um, um, and that's Brad Bozeman. You know, he was a great power center. You know, but in the 2023 scheme that was built around Bryce, it was a zone blocking scheme, and those guys who were good at going forward wasn't good at oh, moving in space yeah. and blocking in space, and so it exposed Bozeman. Um, our left tackle got our left tackle, Iki Kwanu, you know, number six overall pick in 2022. Um, he wasn't he wasn't playing well in that new zone blocking scheme. Um, you know, our left guard um to begin the season, Brady Christensen, got hurt in like week one or two. 
Oh um, gosh. The Pacers were horrible. Austin Corbett, you know, the right guard, you know, he wasn't healthy to begin the season. And so you had like, you know, basically like replacement parts at the right guard position, at the left guard position. The center was struggling. Um, the second year left tackle, um, who looked promising in year one, he was struggling. And Bryce Young had to figure out how to play quarterback, you know, with these NFL grown men mm. chasing after him uh, with all those guys ahead of him struggling. And that's what showed up every week. It was like, honestly, it was awful to watch, you know, because yeah. as fans, you know, like you don't want to like to face your fears, right? Or like, mm-hmm. like of the worst case actually happening, <laughs> uh, you know, when you think about what could possibly go wrong, you know, like in the off season, right? Because like right. you said, it's off season. We're all optimistic. We know we drafted Bryce Young. He was great at Alabama. Um, if he can just be that guy for Carolina, it's going to be fun. We're going to score a lot mm-hmm. of points. Um, he's going to be like this razzle dazzle guy, like a mini Patrick Mahomes. And, you know, it's going to be fireworks in Charlotte. Like we thought like that's what it could be. And it just looked awful um, beginning in week one here in Atlanta. It was uh, bad. And I was, yeah, it was bad. And then like yeah. every week it it seemed to just get worse, you know, to be honest. Um, you know, so I get into like, you know, how that felt a little bit more, but just to kind of stick the free agency. Well, let me just tell you though, and, what, before, and then you can talk about free agency. I am a Colorado Buffalo football fan. That's I've okay. adopted them when Coach Prime went to Colorado. So everything okay. you're saying about an offensive line. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I watched so, it with Shador. Yeah. I so all yeah. like I hear you. Um yeah. and it's you feel helpless, you feel sad and as a fan of football, <laughs> you know there's nothing you can do and it's just bad. And it's just, it, bad. It's just bad and it, nothing can fix it actually. Um and then no. at least in the pros there's a possibility that you could get somebody in, you know, on a Tuesday mm-hmm. or whatever, but there's mm-hmm. zero possibility in college because you can't. You can't. That's it. That's <laughs> like, it. Yeah. So I hear you. I hear you. you know, it's, it's, it's funny because objectively, I was able to like see the flaw in in Colorado early, and I said yeah. to people, "They're going to struggle, right?" Yep. TCU um, game on the offensive line and defensive line because you couldn't stop the run. You know, you couldn't, couldn't do anything. You couldn't block and you couldn't stop the run. <laughs> and so I was like, "Those trenches are going to hurt." But here I was in Carolina. You know, with the clown mask on, you know, thinking that <laughs> thinking that we were better off, you know, <laughs> at the pro level. And I was watching the same thing. But at least for us, we saw in week one, it was bad. Like in, in, in Colorado, it was like a little false sense of hope. Because they know, were winning. Because you beat yeah. Texas. You, know, you beat TCU early. Yeah. And, uh, and so everybody kind of jumped on the on the prime train. You know, it's like, oh, you know, he might run the table. Yeah, right. Nebraska couldn't get a snap yeah. off to save their lives. Yeah. Like the yeah, quarterback so. was like, "Oh, I'm supposed to catch the snap." Like, yeah. Told, yeah. Nobody so, told me that. <laughs> and so everybody, you know, kind of like believed the hype in in Colorado yeah. for a while, but in Carolina, it looked bad, you know, from week one um, with the offensive line. And then as a result, Carolina fans don't like to do this. Um, we've been so um, battered and bruised regarding the quarterback position ever since they let go of Cam Newton um, to where, you know, we've had like the the craziest um, fandom around the quarterbacks since 2020, starting with Teddy Bridgewater and the love, hate, mostly, I would say hate, love. I was a big Mm -hmm. Teddy Bridgewater fan, even though people expected like, you know, just crazy loyalty and devotion to Cam Newton. Although, you know, we could do nothing about the fact that he had moved on. Like they brought in Teddy to kind of be like a replacement slash bridge. The fans hated him, right? Mm-hmm. And I tried my best to support him uh, through that because it was a hard year. You know, 2020 was a COVID year. Um, you know, we couldn't go to games, you know, and I felt like I felt bad for the, the players because I was like, this is a crazy environment for them. They didn't get like a, a good off season. And I was like, I don't want to boo the football team because like during that year, like nothing else was going normally, you know, so I want literally nothing. (laughs) Yeah. And so, uh, so 2020 was like a crazy year for fandom as a Panther fan, because we went through so much loss with Cam Newton, 
um, being being um, released, and then you had Luke Keekley retiring. You had Greg oh, Olson yeah. being released. So a lot of the wait, like the, all of that happened in the same year. In 2020, you know, between January, wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, between January and March of 2020, we lost Luke retired first. Greg Olson was cut. Cam Newton was cut. And so, uh, and fans were livid, right? And then in the midst of all that, the um, the running back position had, be, had been devalued that year because both of the Super Bowl teams um, had made it as far as they did with like really cheap running back options. Oh, gosh. And then Carolina, and Carolina paid Christian McCaffrey a record a record deal the same year that they had lost those other three guys and, you know, cut two of them and one retired. And then they paid Christian McCaffrey, although he earned the money. You know, I just felt like this is the the point where we start resetting, right? You know, like if you can do anything, trade him while his value is crazy high, get draft mm -hmm. picks, rebuild the roster. Um, they didn't take that approach. They decided that we're going to just build around Christian McCaffrey. He's going to be, the the marquee player and that, wasn't that was the thing i got upset about because i was yeah. like no real team is going to like build a sorry team isn't going to build around a running back mm -hmm. but for for three years carolina believed that all they had to do was put pieces around christian mccaffrey and they could win and so the frustration that 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 came after cam you know with first year it was teddy bridgewater the second year it was Sam Donald. The year after that, it was the Baker Mayfield situation. Oh my right? gosh! I'm <laughs> That's telling you, terrible. Yeah, and so, so Teddy, Sam Donald, Baker Mayfield, three different starters in three consecutive seasons, and so in comes Bryce Young, who fans have been clamoring to like, let's just draft the guy, right? Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's do whatever it takes to just draft a young rookie quarterback and let's build around him. So when the, and, and then honestly, there's some nuance there too, because, you know, like after that, that CJ Stroud, Ohio state versus UGA game, that, that all season, a oh, lot of right. people started believing that CJ Stroud was the best pro prospect. Oh my gosh, you're right. And then they did, and, they did Bryce over CJ. Over CJ, right. And, the, and the, to add insult to injury, you know, just having a few inside sources, they didn't even believe that CJ was even like a top two quarterback in the class. It was Bryce and then it was Anthony Richardson for them. And so CJ wasn't even in consideration because of all the S2 testing and, you know, oh, like gosh. The, the homework stuff that they felt like he wasn't as ready as Bryce was, you know, you know, like in terms of being able to recognize NFL defenses and things of that nature. And so, uh, you know, so they went with Bryce, you know, like, and I was a fan of Bryce at Alabama. I thought he was a great um, college player. Like when he was in college, I said that he was the number one quarterback in college, yeah. right? But, I mean, listen, I had to watch him beat Texas twice. Yeah, twice. So I don't even know, yeah, but whatever. Yeah, but <laughs> in Texas, he beat them in Austin. I know. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so, I mean, so he did some amazing things in college as well, but you know, as soon as that college season was over with, then it became about, you know, like, okay, yes, he was the best quarterback in college, but is he the best prospect? It doesn't as translate. A pro? oh right. It gosh. doesn't always translate. It doesn't so, always but, CJ, translate. but CJ's size, his arm talent, um, those things I could say would work in any offensive team, right? Facts. Yeah. I felt like Bryce would have to be in this game that was very uh, specific to like who he was as a player, you know, quick pass, um, you know, really open windows for wide receivers, you know, schemes that scheme wide receivers open, um, you know, good run game, you know, that type of thing, you know, for him to flourish. And, um, and it just turns out that, that he got, he got drafted probably into the worst situation, you know, for him. He got drafted by head Fair. coach and Frank Wright, who never coached a guy of his stature before Frank, before Bryce Young, Frank Wright had only um, coached quarterbacks who were six four or taller. Yeah. Uh, so, 
it was hard to even imagine that he would even draft Bryce Young, given that was his preference. But, you know, as you probably heard, if you follow Carolina Panthers football, uh, there's a lot of belief that that the owner interfered with the draft process. I was just going to say, I was just going to say leadership, but I bit my tongue and I didn't say it. I mean, and nobody can prove this stuff and it really doesn't matter at this point. Um, I think Bryce is a, is a great young man. I think he's a great young leader. I thought he was really tough um, during his rookie season, given that he had very little protection up front. Um, And a lot of the concerns about his size was if he could, endure you know the physical rigors of being mm-hmm. hit uh, by grown men at the nfl level and bryce got hit time and time again i think 62 sacks mm. and he just popped back up you know every time and and i think he proved to to the people who doubted his size from a uh from the from the the physical wear and tear perspective i think he was probably like the healthiest rookie of the class right like he didn't go out for any oh. extended time yeah. like the other guys did. And so he got hit the most and didn't miss any time because of it, right? Um, he missed one game, but I think that was more like precautionary than anything. And so yeah, did so he have the so miss a game? Did CJ Stroud miss a game? CJ Stroud missed, I think, two games. Okay. He he um, was so phenomenal. You can't even Anthony Richardson was gone with like within like what the first four or five, six like weeks. First four games. And um, yeah. I think Will Will Levis, I think, missed some time. Um, and he didn't start the full season anyway. Yeah, he's so, another one. Yeah. Yeah. So so Bryce, Bryce did prove he was tough. The size for him. In, in terms of being able to endure. But I think it still presents some challenges in terms of you know how he sees the field. And um honestly, you know, like when the protection isn't there, I think it just becomes even more overwhelming when you're five foot ten and you got guys that six foot four, six foot five, six six. Bear down yeah. on you with their hands up, you know, and <laughs> yeah. you know, you just don't you can't see over them, you know. So you have to find ways to kind of see in between them or around them. And uh and he just got kind of consumed, you know, by I, I what I saw is like the gravity of the size of these men, you know, once they mm. got close to him, you know. But you know, can I tell you a place. rumor? Can I can, I, can I just tell you something? So yeah. as I mentioned, being like Colorado, some people that will listen to this are probably also Colorado fans. So this won't shock them. A lot uh-huh. of people are like, if this doesn't work out this year for Bryce Young, would and the Panthers still aren't very good, would yeah. they also get Shador? And I think that obviously you guys would have to be in a position to be able to get him, which means this year wouldn't mm-hmm. go well. But mm-hmm. in any way, shape, or form, obviously we don't know what's going to happen. But do you? Would you see your organization doing something like that if year two Bryce Young doesn't look like he's up for the challenge? Oh, I say this about Shador. You know, I, I watched him a lot this past season, and I watched him the season before at Jackson State. Right? Mm, yeah. Um, I would say a lot of what. I saw in CJ Stroud in terms of like the on field talent, um, the, the accuracy, ball placement, you know, being able to throw it, you know, accurately at all levels. Those are the same things I saw out of CJ Stroud at Ohio State, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think they're very similar in that regard. Um, I don't know if the Panthers will be willing to move on Bryce in year three, right? Like he would have okay. to look like horrible this year, you know, for them to just draft his replacement uh, okay. early in, early in, in year three. But I'm not saying this is out of the realm of possibility just because that could happen, right? I don't I don't want it to happen as a fan. I want Bryce to have like the best year imaginable as a fan. Um, but he was the 32nd ranked quarterback in year one, right? So yeah. if I think he, if he finishes year two um in the same light you know then i think a new coach a new gm would have to go to the owner and say hey look man we didn't draft this guy right and Mm -hmm. we don't want our uh legacy you know early you know because it's a it's a new gm it's a new head coach and dave canales and dan morgan um we don't want our tenure here to be tied to bryce's development right yeah it's a business decision yeah it's a business decision so 
what I would hope for them and as a fan is that if Bryce looks horrible, that they are allowed to go out and pick their own quarterback, either through the draft or in free agency. Um, but again, I just hope that we're not faced with that decision. Yeah. Um, the thing I say about Shadur, and, and this is for you as a Buzz fan, <laughs> I love his talent, right? I'm afraid of 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 the. I won't say. It's the say, extra. Yeah, it's it's the extra. It's the and extra. It's, Listen, I'm gonna, you- I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it like you know other people get the the privilege of it being called. I'm gonna call it passion. Mm-hmm. I got you. I so, listen. I it's, it's, I am a just like all fandom, right? Yeah. You have your your extremes. This your extreme that you have your haters and you have your you know. Yeah. I got it. I yeah. am what you would call. I'm very middle of the. I call it like I see it. Some days yeah. I'm like, this is too much. And some days I'm like, this is amazing. Then other days I'm like, oh, why did you do that? So yeah, yeah. I hear what you're saying, though. It's like yeah. there's and I tell people this all the time and I get it. You're a fan of certain mm-hmm. teams and you don't want to hear the truth. Sometimes yeah. the NFL is different. It is yeah. a business. It is. Colin Kaepernick took his team to the Super Bowl Correct. and he decided to kneel and they yeah. decided because of that action, he no longer was able to play football anymore. They you don't care. Them. They don't care. They so don't. all this pacifying and yeah, but that does not yeah. exist. There's 32 teams and they want to get what they need to get. And if they can't get that, you don't matter. It is that simple. They don't care who you are. It doesn't matter. That's true. No, that that's 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 something that we learn, right? You know, through the Kaepernick experience. Yeah. And you know, and it's not just for kneeling; it could be for anything that's considered a distraction. Anything, right? and unless say, you're racing cars, because apparently that's okay, and harming oh yeah, that's, women, unfortunately, because yeah, I can't say women, certain no, words. That's not, that's not a big that's, deal for for no, deal. That's fine. So, uh, yeah. But anyway. <laughs> um, Anyways, okay. Draft. So, so, How did you feel so, about the draft? Yes. <laughs> okay, so so I would say this. Free agency, love free agency from the perspective okay. that they got Bryce, two big uh, interior offensive linemen, you know, and, and Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis, you know, right guard, left guard, uh, nasty guys, you know, you know, be good for the run game, be good for protecting the 5'10 quarterback in Bryce Young. <laughs> um, so I thought that was great. You know, another uh, savvy move that they made was uh, trading for Deontay Johnson from the from the Steelers. Yep. Um, you know, mm-hmm. one thing that Bryce didn't have last year were, were guys who could get open and get open quickly. Uh, we had know. Adam Thielen. And um, although I love Adam Thielen, you know, as a player, I think he's a dog, you know, but Adam Thielen will be 34 when the season starts, right? So, you know, you got I a young quarterback. I didn't realize he was that old. Yeah, he's he's 33 now. He'd be 34 before the season starts. And so uh, um, I think he still has some game left. I just don't know if you want your young quarterback to be dependent on a guy who's 34 years old at wide Absolutely receiver. Not. Yeah. And so De- Deontay Johnson was a good get. You know, we didn't trade away much to get him. Um, and then, um, no, yeah. So you know, the biggest gets for us at free agency were the two guards, and uh, and then we traded for Deontay Johnson um, during that same time period. Um, I think, in, you know, on defense, we got Jadavian Clowney, and I don't want to skip over that mm-hmm. because that's a big deal for. Carolina folks. I'm from the South Carolina. Oh, he side. went to South Carolina. Exactly. And so Jadavion Clowney was the guy that we always wanted to come home, you know, because he's like this NFL mercenary. He goes from team to team every year. Yeah. You know, cutting deals and, and everything. And, um, you know, but we wanted him to come home. He said that he wasn't mature enough to be playing that close to home. He's from Rock Hill, which is. I like, respect that he knows that, yeah. man. Good for yeah. him. Yeah, because that's one of the big things from, you know, guys who are local. South Carolina is a very small um, state in terms of population and all the towns are small and everybody knows everybody. And, you know, and when people make it big, you know, like go to the pros or whatever, you know, from those small towns, they become like bigger than life. But the people at home, um, they like to keep you normal. Right. And they expose you to all the normal things happening at home. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, it's easy to get in trouble back at home and and all those things. So I was I was happy like that he had that self-awareness, you know, but now he's, you know, he's older now, too. Yeah. 
Um, but, you know, he was able to come in and replace a guy that we lost, you know, in Brian Burns. Um, he may not be as dynamic as Burns, you know, at this stage in his career, but but he's a great story. You know, I think he, he was a productive player last year. If he can just be that again, I think, you know, that was a great free agency get for us. And um, yeah. and then we added some some other key pieces um, on defense, like Josie Jewell. Um, you know, we had Jordan Fuller. We, had, we brought in a lot of guys who had familiarity with our defensive coordinator, Ejiro Evero. Where so, did your head coach come from? Where is his, where are his roots? Where What organization so, did he come from? So Dave Canales spent over a decade in Seattle. Um, Seattle. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so he he had various positions on the offensive side of the ball. Okay, he worked himself up, you know, from the assistant level all the way to like being a wide receivers coach, tight ends coach, you know, and okay. then he became a, a, like a QB coach. And then last year was his first year as an offensive coordinator down in Tampa. And so what he's noted for was his involvement with um, reviving Geno Smith's. Career. Well, that's Seattle. good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And so then he went to Tampa last year, and everybody thought that Baker that Mayfield Tampa did well, Austin, but Baker did well. You know, Austin. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you know, he revived Baker. So the reason why the Panthers selected him was because of that history of reviving these quarterbacks, and so they felt like you know you don't necessarily have to revive Bryce; you just have to develop him, right? Um, and so they brought him in because he had seemingly he had the best plan for Bryce, you know, when he presented his case as the head coach candidate during the interview process. And um, and he also has ties with Dan Morgan, who began his personnel side of football in Seattle. So they grew up in the Seattle organization together. OK, cool. So can I can those- I be honest with you for a second here? I the type of fan I am, mm-hmm. all of these intricate details, I that's not my fandom. <laughs> but I'm obsessed with it. Whenever people know like where their coach came from, what his tree looks yeah. like, what posi- like this is why I love doing this is because yeah. like, like I said, that's not my type of fandom. Like I, I don't consider myself like X's and O's and that much in those details. I'm more of a, um, I see it from a bigger picture and I can tell you like, yeah. Hey, we need to let go of that guy. Like right now, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's yeah. cool to hear all, I love that. I love, 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 love. So it's been one of my favorite things about doing this is are those little details because now when I watch, I have more context. It's oh, yeah. not just Bryce Young. And I obviously know Deontay Johnson and I know JJ Van Klein because I think it was with the Ravens last year. Uh, yeah. But now I know like, oh, okay. Like I yeah. get it. I get this puzzle. Yeah. So that's yeah. awesome. So like, so so what they wanted was alignment. And, uh, you know, that's something that Carolina hasn't had, honestly, you know, in probably like over a decade, you know, ever mm-hmm. since that Super Bowl team, um, you know, the, that coaching staff started, you know, like going other places and, um, you know, Ron Rivera, you know, and his coaching, you know, kind of start dropping off when you start losing a lot of the assistants, you know, that yeah. grew up with him. And so, um, you know, you had a lot of mismatch pieces you know that was put together for a few years and it showed on the field and um even last year with bryce young you know you had frank reich you know who had just had a, a failed season in indy and then he brought in an offensive coordinator that came from sean McVay and the rams and their philosophies didn't didn't marry up in the line and you know and bryce young had too many voices in his head you know trying to coach him up and get him to see things on the field you know their own way and all that confusion and chaos, it, it showed up in a in a really dysfunctional product on the field. And now, you know, with Dave Canales, you know, he went back and, and got these guys that, you know, went with him to Tampa from Seattle. And then the other guys who didn't make that track from Seattle to Tampa, he went and got them and brought them to Carolina now. Oh, so cool. now he has okay. the, the band is back together, if you will, um, you know, from the Seattle like days. And, and okay. so – it, it feels really, really um, well thought. You know, I didn't love the Dave Canales hire in the beginning because I thought there was some some really name brand coaching candidates that were available uh, that they didn't get. You know, um, and I didn't really know Dave Dave Canales well, but I did. Yeah, that's why I'm like his. It's yeah. like everything. The name you've heard it, but I'm like, where yeah. did he come from? 
Okay. Yeah, and and but I get it now more than I got it, you know, back in in January and February. You know, I just because you know why? Because it's a complete picture. Life yeah. lesson, folks. Yeah. The first thing you see is usually not the best thing you see. Okay, you have yeah. to get the whole picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it's it's coming together well. Obviously, we want to see it play out on the field, you know, but, uh, yeah. you know, but so then what, it, okay. So we haven't talked about the draft. How okay. did, how did that, the team that they put together, the coaching staff, the plan, mm -hmm. the system, your brain kind of going, okay, I kind of see what we're doing here. I, I, did I that you, show up in the draft? It showed up with the very first pick we made. It showed up with the very first pick we made. Um, a lot of people you know this was an interesting year for us in Carolina because we didn't have a first round pick because that's the pick that we traded to Chicago in the package to get the, the, the number one overall in 2023 that we drafted Bryce Young with. Oh, okay. So we, okay. Didn't, we didn't have a, you know, we have the most unique year. Oh, gosh. It was you guys. It was yeah. you guys in the Browns it, that picked that didn't have used, a first. Yeah, it was us. And, and Chicago used our pick to pick Caleb Williams. Right. Okay. Okay. Gosh, I was so, on. I was on the call with the Browns fan, and we could not. Yeah. We were like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was okay. Carolina, and so we did not have a pick in the first round. And uh, you know, obviously, there were a lot of wide receivers, you know, who were available this particular year. Um, mm -hmm. You know, two guys from from Texas, you know, were mm -hmm. were high on the board. You know, Xavier Worthy, um, Ad Mitchell, you know, and so. But there were a host of other guys like Lad McConkey and Keon Coleman and Xavier Leggett, you know, and and um Troy Franklin, just a, a host of wide receiver talent. And that's not even like the top guys who went early in right. the first, right? right? And so we knew that we were going to be picking in the area where we could get one of the guys I just named. Um Xavier Leggett was a wide receiver who played at the University of South Carolina, you know, about an hour and a half south of Charlotte. Um, in the in the pro day season, uh, where you know we go to you know, the scouts and everybody go to the different colleges to see their pro days, there was a lot of um, buzz about how many people from the Panthers organization went to the University of South Carolina to okay. see Xavier Leggett up close, right? And so a lot of you know media were talking about you know how many people from the Panthers organization showed up there was like this video clip of um you know the media interviewing the Xavier Leggett down at South Carolina and his country accent and all that stuff blew up and so a lot of people thought they were just kind of blowing smoke but I was putting together context clues and I was like no they're they're serious like they really want to draft him but everybody you know had their darlings you know how it is in draft season everybody wants yep. to draft their favorite guy from their favorite school mm -hmm. but I kept telling them I said look man I said you know where there's smoke, there's there's fire with um, with Xavier Leggett because they he he went to he went and visited Charlotte four times, and then there was this um, this writer John Crumpler, you know, who covers the Texans. He reached out to me in my DMs and said, "Hey, look, man, um, <laughs> you're so let me just say I'm, your yeah. DMs are like on I mean, fire. Hey, look, they, they're more <laughs> on fire than people think, you know, when it comes to the NFL <laughs> stuff. A lot of people don't realize who actually reaches out to me, uh, like." It, it's, no, it's really I, I uh, listen, I got uh, it. Like it, noted. It's, it's, it's shocking. I didn't even know I would be like this, you know, but I, I try to keep it low key. Um, and a lot of times they reach out to me because I don't, I don't go and tweet what they tell. Me, right. Right. As you shouldn't. Yep. But you know, but John reached out to me and he said, Hey, look, um, I'm interviewing as Xavier Leggett and I don't think Houston will draft him based on need. Um, but I'm interviewing him and I know there's a lot of buzz, you know, from Carolina about um, liking him as a prospect. Do you want me to ask him some questions on behalf of the Panthers? And I was like, oh, yeah, I got some questions. Oh, for I him. love that. And so a lot of that stuff came out, you know, from the interview. And he admitted that Carolina had told him if he's there at 33, he's their guy. Right. And so that came out and the clip was shared, you know, and um and so a lot of Panthers fans were upset when they heard him admit that because they was like, why are we being so dumb and, you know, talking to you know, prospects about where we're going to draft them? Like now, 
if somebody jumps ahead of us, it's going to be, you know, crazy. And like, why would we be so immature about stuff like that? And they even like the media in Charlotte even confronted Dave Canales um, about, you know, whether why? or not it was true, you know, whatever. Oh, okay. you know, and, you know, he kind of blew it off and said, oh, yeah, you know, but we told 50 other guys the same thing. As he should. Right. <laughs> yeah. But but the reason, you know, you asked the question about how did that alignment show up in the draft? Well, as Xavier Lee gets uh, his comp, his pro comp and prospect comp is DK Metcalf, who oh, those really? guys I didn't in know Seattle, that. Yeah, those guys in Seattle drafted DK and developed DK, right? Big. I see what you're doing I, there. I, I see. Hey, you feel me? You asked the question. <laughs> I got and you. So I got the, you. The height, weight, speed thing, you know, that they went and got DK for, you know, I like big it. guy. Six three, two twenty five plus runner four three, um didn't just a dream a of a just receiver, a dream, just you know, just an adult, <laughs> you know, didn't have the college production to to show who he was, but had all the attributes and the makings of a of a great yeah, player. Right? Uh, that was the same thing with Xavier Leggett. He didn't come on to late in his college career in terms of production, so a lot of people were questioning. You know his talent. Why did he wait so long to bloom? And he actually has like a a really uh, tough story about why he didn't get in the field. He dealt with you know like I think he lost his father. You know, um, like you know the COVID year he got hurt, and so he really didn't get a chance to really get on the field and really focus on the wide receiver position until this past year, and um, and he made the most of it. And so those guys was like, okay, we were all in Seattle together. Yeah. In order to run our offense, we got to have a guy who's like a crafty route runner, like um, Tyler Lockett, and we got that in Deontay Johnson, right? Mm -hmm. But we also has to have we also have to have a guy who can like be big and physical, outrun guys, out muscle guys, um, you know, be good at the point point of a cat point of attack, can win the 50 50 catches. That's the get. And so while he wasn't everybody's favorite receiver at that. Number 30, well, we had the 33rd pick. They actually traded into the they first round. In. Yeah, I was going yeah, to say that, To get him because they thought, like, if we trade up one spot to get him, we ensure that we get him. Plus, if he's the guy we think he is, we'll get the fifth-year option. we get yep. the fifth-year option with him. And so they did that. They got their guy. So for the offensive philosophy that they have and the scheme they have, they want him to become that DK Metcalf guy. Good. Right, you know, and, good and, and so so the alignment showed up with the very first pick, and then um, and then I think the very next pick, Jonathan you know, Brooks. just sticking to the draft was was your guy, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, Jonathan Brooks, you know, who was uh, I love believed to be Jonathan the best Brooks. running back, and they thought he was the best running back in the draft, right? Yeah, and Jerry Jones made the rookie mistake, you know, the day before. And talking about Jonathan Brooks and how much he loved him because the the doctor, um, the team doctor for the Cowboys was the guy who repaired his ACL. Right. Wow. Oh. Of and course, so, Jerry Jones can't keep his mouth shut. Of yeah. Course. And so he could, he could keep his mouth shut. So he was he was just doting over you know who Jonathan Brooks was as a prospect and how he loved the young man. Said it was the best interview he had ever had. You know, with the <laughs> running back. He could and, not. Like, are you kidding? Yeah. He said so all they, this? He said all of that, right? And so Carolina, who had traded back from number 39, I forget with whom, um, you know, we were watching the board, and then the Cowboys pick was coming up. Jonathan Brooks was still on the board, so Carolina had to jump ahead of the Cowboys. So they jumped one place okay. ahead of the Cowboys and picked Jonathan Brooks because they knew that if he had lasted to the Cowboys, they were going to pick him. And so yeah. that's how we, that's the Jonathan Brooks story. So we that's jumped nice. back up. I'm I'm so go. glad. I'm glad that Jonathan Brooks also went to a place that's also young, you know, like yeah. he has a younger yeah. court. Like, I don't know. I And again, I'm talking like I talked to, had a conversation with Jonathan Brooks over the phone and I didn't, <laughs> but I think yeah. some guys really feel connected to that because yeah. It's almost their experience too. And just seeing what he had to do at Texas. I mean, he was behind B. John Robinson at Texas. Like exactly. and and he had to earn his spot this yeah. year. And he came in. And I mean, I just I 
at first I was nervous. I was like, oh no, not Carolina. And then I was like, no, I think they built their line in off in the off yeah. season. So, yeah. so yeah, I was super happy to see him go to a place where he has a young quarterback. He can mm -hmm. grow with him. Um, yeah. I, I think that's going to be great. I was super excited for that. Yeah. And we don't, we don't necessarily have to like rush him into action either, you know? Mm -hmm. So we have a returning guy in Chuba Hubbard. Um, he's not like a marquee name in the NFL, but, you know, he's serviceable um, early down back. You know, we still have at the current time, we still have um, uh, Miles Sanders. You know, I was who's say, didn't you tweet team. about somebody? I feel like. Oh, Rashad Penny. OK, I was like, I feel like yeah, because Rashad he used Penny. to be in Seattle. See now you see now <laughs> how is it aligning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, not, okay. Yeah. So I'm with you. They, they, I'm here. I'm have, here. They have, yeah, you, so you 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 with me now? <laughs> yeah. So they went and got Penny, you know, running back who knows their system, runs the way that they like to run, um, and that might spell the ending for uh, Miles Sanders, right? You know, if Penny is actually healthy and can be who they want him to be, he might end up being the third back, and you know. Typically, teams don't keep, you know, okay. four, four running backs on the active roster. So, yeah. Miles Sanders, you know, he may get dealt, you know, um, as a post-June 1 casualty or whatever. I don't know yet. You know, he's still – I think he's still a decent back. You know, he just had a bad year in a bad offense. Um, yeah. But right now, I mean, it's a crowded room because we just invested so much into Jonathan Brooks. So, mm -hmm. I feel like Chuba is going to stay. Obviously, Jonathan Brooks is going to stay. And then you mm -hmm. got a guy that knows their system like Penny – he may be looked at as more valuable than Miles Sanders. Plus, Penny can For play sure. some special teams too. And Penny, and so, Penny uh, is, it, dare I say, Penny's a good. I mean, he's, see, he's a lot of people don't know that he's just been hurt a lot. But yeah, he's, he's pretty. Explosive. I mean, he runs hard. Yeah. He runs yeah. like you know. He's yeah. he 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 see, blocks you know, well. You know ball. Yeah, you know ball because <laughs> a lot of our fans, a lot yeah. of our fans don't know ball. You know, like that. They just see him, and I actually thought. You know, early in the off season, that he would be somebody that they would explore, right? Mm, okay. And so you know, people like look at what I do, like I have like some crystal ball or whatever. But as you it's can see, football. I'm just it's just football. So football it's is football. like really, really commonsensical, right? And the and the coaches, you know, they all want guys who speak their language. You know, mm -hmm. um, the guys who understand, you know, like how their coaching style and their scheme and yep. and all those things. And they don't. And even if they can't get all of their guys. They go get guys at certain positions who can help be coaches on the field, right? Exactly. Who can help translate for the for the young guys. Yeah. Um, and those guys may not even make it to the final 53, but they were there all summer long mm -hmm. helping install their system and their program. And um, and those guys are invaluable to coaches. And so, like, when you have these big overhauls and shifts in the front office and, and coaching, uh, I automatically start scouring you know, like the free agent list to see who's been with these guys at yeah. their other stops and like what guys make sense for what we need. And so, um, so I do that a lot. So, so Penny's another mm -hmm. one, um, you know, so Jonathan Brooks, he gets to come in and I hope he's, he's ready to go early, but if he's not, then we can ease him into Ash. He can be part yeah. of a platoon. Um, and so that's our second pick. Our third pick was Trevin Wallace. I didn't really know him that well um, before we picked him because I don't watch a lot of Kentucky football, but he's a, a freak athlete. Either. Yeah, he's a freak athlete. Um, you know, likes you know likes contact. You know, like linebackers should. He has the the athleticism to to travel with running backs and tight ends. Okay. Um, and coverage. You know, so you know the Carolina Panthers. You know, have a history of having good linebackers, and currently, um, and probably for the last two or three seasons, we haven't had like that prototypical Mike Backer, um, Got it. you know, type. And so, you know, he can be that guy. He might take some time to develop. But, you know, Dan Morgan is a linebacker. Um, he's the GM now. I would like to believe that he knows what he's looking for in the linebacker you, prospect. I so mean, you would think. I got to trust. Yeah, I got to I gotta <laughs> yeah. trust that guy. Um, yeah. And then the fourth overall pick, you know, for us, you know, that we got in the fourth round, is um Jatavian Sanders somebody that you're familiar yep. with? <laughs> he wasn't my number one tight end in the draft. I was leaning towards uh you know obviously I, I didn't lean towards I was Brock Bowers was the consensus number one. Tight well, end. obviously, yeah. Yeah, but then so, it was between. Go ahead. I was gonna say the the thing about JT is that a lot of people around 
sources and people, right, said that they were concerned with, they weren't sure if he was taking this next kind of gap time series. Because you know how it happens, right? College football ends. And then you, some people take a week, a couple of days, whatever it is for you. And then you literally have to train. It's time to transition into yeah. being a pro and you got to yeah. work at it, train at it, eat it, breathe it, sleep it, all the things. Um, yeah. And then he shows up at his pro day and it's, it's like, what the, what the F like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, like this is literally your golden opportunity. So I do, I will say that I think it was, again, some people have to do things and not do well and go in the fourth round and kind of lose their whatever for them to be like, Oh God, I need to get it together. Like, yeah. Yeah. uh, (laughs) So I hope for JT, he does get it together and that he, but again, I think he'll benefit from having like Brooks and Bryce young and that younger core that can be like, bruh, we're going to the gym for him. um, Obviously, you know, like his, testing his own field testing was was bad and, and as bad. you're explaining mm-hmm. um you know he showed up you know ill prepared for that moment yeah right? wasn't ready and um you know but so that explains his slide to the fourth round right mm-hmm. because a lot of people had it between him and being senate as being the second tight end taken and it was being senate and not him but you know when i look at what the panthers need what bryce young needs i think he needs Sanders more than he needed Senate, right? Um, Senate was more versatile, you know, obviously a little bit more athletic, but but JT has the hands. And yes. um, <laughs> and so we need a pass catching tight end. Carolina hasn't had that since they released Greg Olson in 2020. Oh, Greg Olson. Um, and so for every young quarterback, it's not like 100% accurate, but I've always believed the way I was taught football that what well, all quarterbacks need a really reliable pass catching tight end, but specifically like the young quarterbacks, um, because it's the it's the it's an easy uh, safety valve for them. They're mm-hmm. always in the part of the field where they can see them, mm-hmm. um, and and you know you can make a, a quick short pass. You know it goes for seven eight yards. You know it helps you keep the chain moving. It, yeah, and you, you stay ahead at, of the chain. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> that's the name of the game. You get a guy like. Uh, Pat Mahomes is already being talked about as being the greatest of all time, but he's never played without Kelsey. I nope. used to think it was Tyreek. It's Kelsey, right? And, it's a safety um, and a lot of, it's, it's a, yeah, and, and, yeah, and JT, for all the things that he may not do well, like run blocking and things like that, he plays the tight end position from a pass catching perspective like a savvy vet already, right? So, yeah. Yeah, he'll do if, that. He, if he has the, the work ethic, you know, to to be able to come in and compete with NFL linebackers and NFL safeties. And if he can beat those guys, um, I think he has the opportunity to do the most of all the rookies on this team because, like, we have other running backs, right? So, yeah, because Bryce needs um, Jonathan, him in a way. Bryce, Bryce needs him more yeah. than he needs anything else. That, that makes draft. sense. That makes yeah. sense. And so I hope that he's ready to, right? I hope yeah, that he's ready. I, I mean, listen, if 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 you have that kind of pro day when everyone's expecting you to not have that kind of pro day and then you have that kind of pro day and then yeah. you fall to the fourth yeah. round, if that doesn't motivate you, I don't know what will. Yeah, we're, we're about to find out who he is, though, because. When is your like, mini there camp? Isn't, there isn't, there isn't a mini camp is this week. Oh, okay. Okay. And so, so I might be in is, your DMs next week being like, so <laughs> like, how did he yeah, look? It's, it's cool. That's no, cool. Um, I, I don't, there isn't a tight end on the roster who is a natural, who's a better natural pass catcher than him. Right. Oh, okay. You know, but, well, perfect. but if, if, but if he comes in and if, if he's lazy, you know, if he, if yeah. he's disinterested, you know, then at the NFL level, they're not going to want that, you know, so. Nope. But he has, he has the perfect, perfect opportunity to, like, be one of the top young tight ends in the league if he comes in and works for it because he doesn't have to compete very hard, you know, to yeah. get out there on the field. Um, well, that's good. So then, we, I mean, we had some other guys, you know, that I go through really quickly. We picked up a nickelback type, you know, and Shaw Smith-Wade, you know, um, 
So I just, I mean, I don't think he's going to be a middle, a, a needle mover early. Um, but you know, he's noted for being like kind of a dog, you know, um, our GM's theme this year was that he wanted dogs on the team. So, Good. um, I didn't know much about him, um, but you know, he comes in, I think from Washington state, um, he, he, he's playing inside, you know, for the first time, um, they first tried him out at the senior bowl in that role. So he played well at the senior bowl. So they liked him. Um, then we got this guy, Jaden Crumetti, I think from Mississippi state. Um, just a big, you know, defensive lineman. You know, you can't have enough of them when you pan when you play in the odd front like we do. So we picked them up, and then last we picked up Pitts, um, we picked up Michigan's Michael Barrett. He's a linebacker, older guy, you know, but you know, tough as nails. You know, lights contact. You know, five eleven, so he's a little small for the position. But you know, he's a linebacker, so it's just like it was with Trevin Wallace. Dan Morgan saw what he saw. He liked it. You know, I didn't know him very well, but he played on the championship defense at Michigan. Can't beat that. And so I have to, I have to trust him. So um, another guy I'm going to mention, and then we can move away from the draft is uh, uh, we got this guy as an undrafted free agent. His name is Jalen Coker. He played at Holy Cross. Um, he was a guy who was projected to go, you know, in the fifth round by a lot of people, okay. uh, and he didn't get drafted. But we got him as an undrafted free agent. I think nice. he has a an outside shot of making the roster, um, you know, and beating out somebody that's on the current, you know, active roster, you know, from last year. So that. oh, that's going to be an interesting competition that, to watch because I, I think, you know, if you go and look at that guy, you know, kind of like see how he's made up, um, he just got all the intangible stuff that you would Go want. for him. So if, you know what? Uh, yeah. I, don't, I was just going to say, I, I'm not rooting for anybody to lose their job, but I'm definitely yeah. rooting for him to do what he yeah. needs to do. So whatever yeah. that, whatever that means is whatever that means, yeah. but I, I'm rooting for him because I love a story of this is what should have happened. It didn't happen. So now what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Like I said, yeah. before we hit record, right? How many yeah. times are yeah. you going to go pick the ball back up and get your skills up? Like, yeah. it's like, and so I, I, I think he's that guy. So my thing was, I don't know who has to go, but I believe somebody it, will. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. respect it. I respect it. So I'm going to ask you kind of like the, the next question that I think I, I, I'm going to be transparent with you. I think it's a little bit harder to answer from a team that wasn't as great last year because it, you probably have a lot more concerns on your team than an average team would probably yeah. have just because yeah. there's so many more moving parts, um, mm -hmm. which in my opinion kind of would probably bleed into the also the schedule because if you yeah. have concerns now, most games are kind of going to be like, a, oh gosh, but looking at all the moves that you've made, the way that you're feeling about the coaching staff and everything, what would be besides winning, of course, what would be like a concern as you head into the year? Um, I, I, I think I know what you're going to say, but I want to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> In terms of what would be a concern. Yeah, I'm going, okay. I'm just going to tell you my answer. And then if you disagree, tell me something else. Okay. I feel okay. like from what I'm hearing is making sure that the evaluation of talent and making sure that all the players that you all think are going to fit like they're supposed to actually do fit and work like it's supposed to. Because if they do, that will allow Bryce to flourish. And ultimately, that's the goal. So that would be my concern if I was a Panthers fan. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Well, I mean, it's 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 aligned with your thought, you know, and it's not the same though. Um, my biggest concern is that, that the pieces that they brought in to fit around Bryce actually play well, right? But will Bryce play that much better as a result? Oh yeah, so like a a part B of my answer. Yeah, because it's yeah. because it's okay. not like a, it's not like it's not a guarantee. Like I think True. as fans, we just want to play it like we play in Madden, right? Yeah, like, that's true. Oh man, my my first year suck, you know, in franchise mode. <laughs> Let me go and upgrade my talent, you know, you know, and get some free agents or whatever, and and I'm a, I'm gonna make the quarterback is just gonna by default play better because I put better pieces around him. True, but what? But what if he still struggles, mm -hmm. right? And what if it? What and, if that? What if that wasn't even it? 
Yeah, what yeah. what if all those things wasn't it like yeah. we can currently say? Like because so early in 2023, we just chalked it up to oh, it's bad coaching. Frank Wright sucks. Thomas Brown sucks. The wide receivers suck. DJ mm -hmm. Chalk sucks. You know, like all these people suck and everybody sucked but Bryce, right? Yeah. So now we're going to go get Bryce a new coach, better offensive linemen, better wide receivers, better running backs, a tight end, right? So you go do all that. Yeah. But what if he doesn't come up to the level yeah. of the guys that fall around him? And so, and the reason that is, the reason why that's so concerning is because it's like the wet nets conversation start happening, right? Like you asked mm -hmm. about what it's about Shador. Shador. Yeah, it's when the Shador conversation those, starts. Those are yeah. some real controversial topics that begin to bubble up if Bryce doesn't pick it up, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm wanting to see is how his game elevates with Deontay Johnson as Xavier Leggett, Jonathan Brooks, Jatavian Sanders, Robert Hunt, Damian Lewis, like yeah. these guys were brought in to elevate him, mm -hmm. but they can't carry him. Correct. He has, he has, he has to stand. To, yeah. He has to stand up on his he own and he stand, has to yeah. lift himself up. So the 5'10 guy that we adore, we can't baby him. Right. Agreed. Yeah. So I, we need for Bryce to, to, to attack year two, to take to the coaching because he wasn't a perfect quarterback in year one. You know, we gave him a lot of, of course, uh, he yeah ex excuses and things like that. But he was he, he deserved some of them because he, at the end of the day, he's still a rookie quarterback. And I think we yeah. are too eager for these guys to come out looking like Pat Holmes, Pat Mahomes, uh, or CJ Stroud, or <laughs> CJ Stroud. Yeah, I mean, and that and that honestly <laughs> made it worse for worse. Bryce that mm -hmm. guy he was compared to had such a historic year for as a rookie did, and we passed yeah. over that dude to get him. And so now it's like, he has to like be at the CJ level for somebody to think that he's good enough. And I don't necessarily think that, but I do think with the pieces that they brought in for him with the coach that they hired to help him get better. Cause right now this coach is batting a thousand in terms of who he's helped. Right. That's so true. If if Bryce doesn't improve or you know show the progress to the level of the other guys that he's been around and using all these new skill players and stuff around him and the offensive line, um, a lot of people are going to question Bryce Young, and it's going to yeah. be it could be detrimental to him going forward, you know, in his career. So, what I want to see the most is for Bryce Young to ascend um and he don't necessarily have to be like an elite quarterback for me right if bryce can just get to the place where we're talking about him being at least middle of the pack in the nfl that's fair yeah i think that's yeah. fair from 32 I, to middle of the pack is fair that's fair so if you can be mentioned somewhere in between 10 and 20 top 10 and 20 then i would think that's a very very good jump for him and you know in carolina panthers can like have this collective sigh of relief because that's what the season has all been about. You know, like they want to pretend that it that it wasn't, but three of our top four picks were all offensive guys. Oh, yeah. Our first two free agent acquisitions that we paid big money to were offensive oh, wow. linemen. Yeah. That's what five players that were brought in to specifically address the quarterback play. Right. Mm -hmm. And so Bryce was the number one overall pick and he can't, he can't run from that, you know? And so how you are evaluated in terms of success will always be evaluated by when you were drafted, just like yep. with Baker Mayfield, you know, yep. just like when those guys struggled, their struggle was looked at through a magnifying glass because of yeah. where they were drafted. Where they know? were so, That's what it comes yes. with though. And you know yeah, what? Yeah. I listen, I hope he has Nick Saban's phone number. And I, and listen, I, I hope when he has those dark days and everything's terrible yeah. and he's struggling, he can pick up the yeah. phone and say, coach Saban, like, yeah, I need to hear, like, you know what I mean? Like, remind me 
why I run, why I won yeah. that starting job. Remind yeah. Yeah. me again, right? Because I I don't know him, but it's like this is it. I, I don't cool want to be story. dramatic and say you're, he's playing for his career here, but in a lot of ways, he has to get better. Well, I, I will, I'll give you this quick story. Like I was looking at this business venture um, and I met these guys who um, who run the business and, you know, it's in sports training and stuff, right? And so uh, the two guys who, who were running the business, they were Bryce Young teammates at Alabama, right? Mm. So these big, humongous guys, you know, like I'm talking to them. Yeah, and, um, you know, one was a tight end, one was an offensive lineman, but they they got to Alabama at the same time Bryce did. And, well, they were there before him because they're a little older. Um, But the offensive lineman was telling me about how good Bryce actually is, right, and how it hurt him to see Bryce struggle the way that he did his rookie year in Carolina. Uh, but he gave me the story about when Bryce showed up, you know, from California on the scene down in Tuscaloosa. And he told me that he said Bryce was a uh, he said, you know, Bryce was supposed to come in and compete with Mac Jones. You know that, you know, in Max last year down there. Uh-huh. OK, but he didn't really, um, you know, rush it. You know, he didn't really press himself. He really just took the role as. Mac is the guy, right? Okay. And I'm gonna sit there, I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna absorb and learn and everything while Matt goes out, you know, and and as we all saw, Matt went out and had a tremendous year. They won the national championship yeah. and everything. And Mac, you know, was in contention for the Heisman. Um, and, and that led to him being a first round draft pick. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when it was Bryce's time, everybody knew he was ready and he just stepped into that role. And then he went out and got his husband, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they were saying that Bryce just did everything the right way. Now, good. now you go to Carolina as the first overall pick, just like coming out of high school, he was the number one overall QB prospect. Um, but he didn't have to like rush into it at Alabama. In Carolina, he had to be thrown yeah. into the fire. Yeah. Okay. Right? I see where you're going. You see, I see what I'm saying? Going. So yeah. So maybe so he needed that time. He needs. A I little think bit. he kind of. I think he. I think he was drafted number one overall because the consensus was that he was the most pro ready coming out of college. You know, he had run a pro scheme with Bill O'Brien, uh, who you know went to the Patriots, uh, but but Bill O'Brien had you know been at the NFL. He had coached mm-hmm. Deshaun Watson. You know, like. And then he did that stuff with Bryce. So Bryce's mental preparation and everything was on another level in the scouting process. And they okay. all heard that from him. And that's why he was the number one guy for that's the Panthers. separated right? him. Okay. And, 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 and Carolina wanted the quarterback that they perceived was the most ready to play because they 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 were tired of waiting on their guy. Got and so it. let's draft a guy that we can play right now. He may not have the highest ceiling of all the prospects, but we can play him day one. And I, I think, I don't, I don't think they necessarily got it wrong, but I think they kind of underestimated how unready Bryce might've been for a bad situation because it's easy to step That's into fair. the Bama situation where everybody's hyper talented the offensive line are the best in the country. The wide receivers mm-hmm. are the best in the country. The biggest, backs are the best fastest, in the strongest. <laughs> and now you go to the worst, the worst, <laughs> worst roster on the worst team in the NFL, and you ask to be the most ready, right? Yeah, that that and, doesn't mix well. And now I, I just think what we saw was all of that. So, but because we saw such poor play all around on the offense and you know they decided well it's not the quarterback it's all these other things right so let's go get all the other things so the quarterback can play better so you know while yes you know i'm concerned that all those things come together the way that they want them to come together and all that like i think i kind of trust that those things will come together good so then it becomes okay will bryce be ready for his 111th of all yep. the things that need to come together. And yeah. if he's ready, 
then I think we're actually going to surprise some people. Good. I hope yeah. so. And you know what? I, I'm one of those people that roots for every single black coach in the NFL and every single yeah. black quarterback in the NFL um, yeah. until they play my team. Um, I <laughs> don't cheer for them then. I don't want them to do bad. I just can't yeah. cheer for them. Um, yeah. And so I want him to be successful and I want right. him to be a quarterback that doesn't have all the intangibles as far as physically what you see, yeah. um, because similar to like Kyler Murray, like Kyler Murray physically doesn't have what you see, but he brings yeah. something um, that yeah. not a lot of people can bring. And I'm just going to take this a step further and say a lot of black quarterbacks are probably more like Bryce Young and Kyler mm -hmm. Murray than mm -hmm. they are. Um, Joe Burrow and insert, you know, who, whoever yeah. you want to put there. Um, and, yeah. 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 And so I think that his success is would change the NFL's perception on a lot of things. And I love change. Listen, I don't yeah. say this often, but I'm a progressive. I like change. I <laughs> yeah. like when things are kind of moving and evolving and getting better yeah. and, and more opportunity and, he signifies that for me. And so yeah, I hope does. that he, not even just for me, but even for the fan base, I just hope that he, like you said, just gets better. You're not asking yeah. him to have 6,000 passing, you know, you're not asking mm -hmm. him to like break records and do all these things. You're just asking well, him, let us see you take a couple of steps. Yeah, let us, that's, you know, that's what, that's what we need. You know, like we, yeah. want, we want him to be considered amongst the elite because that's what we see. Um, you know, at the end of each playoff season, you know, like with right. the final yeah. two quarterbacks or the final four quarterbacks, you know, at least two or three of them are going to be like the the top of the top, you know, the cream of the yeah. crop. And so we think that that automatically equates to you being uh, in like Super Bowl contention if your quarterback is like one of the top five. But it doesn't always have to be that way. Um, but you can take a guy like Bryce and he can become a guy that's that's really accurate that you no know, that keeps the chains moving makes some plays with his legs yeah. um the one thing the, other than his toughness the one thing that i loved about his rookie season was we didn't have a lot of opportunities to be in games late and have opportunities to win yeah but you know one thing that was noted about him in the in the pre-draft process was that he was like he was super super cool right all the time he seems like, cool <laughs> he seems cool, and, but when he had opportunities to like drive the ball down the field in those clutch moments, even on this in this bad season that we had, Bryce was super calm. He made the plays. He wasn't rattled. And so my thing is for him is maybe he doesn't pass for like like you said the six thousand yards and you know forty touchdowns or whatever. But if we can be good enough to be in games late then he's that type of quarterback that I can trust to go win us the game. And you know what? That's, that's a, that's an it. That's a thing, yeah. right? That's a, that's a, we can't call it. I, it's not going to yeah. show up on paper. It's just, right. I trust it. I trust in it. a way it's like the Mike Tomlin effect, right? I, like, yeah. I can give you reasons why, but really it comes down to he's a leader of men and a football coach. Yes. Yeah. Not a lot of people have both. <laughs> no, no, and, and that's and, and, and for for a quarterback, a quarterback can be talented, but we've seen a lot of good quarterbacks. You know, when when it's like the final two minutes, mm -hmm. you know, like they just can't deliver. I think Fair Bryce enough, yeah. is going to be one of those guys who actually delivers when he gets to a place where he can be in those positions. Uh, but he has to make a leap, I think, as a player. To where he can even consistently be in positions to where he gets to dictate the outcome of games. Yeah. I rather love that. than just being the guy who's playing catch up or, you know, just struggling through it. Like, and I think he can, you know, let me just yeah. say that for anybody listening, you know, for any Carolina Panthers fan that listens to this or any other NFL fan, um, Bryce has always had a lot to overcome because he is five foot ten and he's always probably been like the smallest prospect, the smallest quarterback. And Everywhere he's been up to this point, he's always risen to be the number one quarterback at the high school level, at the college level. And so although the NFL is a different arena altogether and it's going to be his most significant challenge as a player, I don't need him to necessarily 
rise up to be the number one quarterback in NFL. But I think a person who can rise to the top of both classes, high school and, and college, can at least take some steps to be, you know, considered at least in the middle tier, you know, to, you know, to maybe, you know, the top 80% of yeah. quarterbacks in this league. And then anything I get above that is just gravy. You know what it's, I'm saying? Yeah. We'll, we'll accept yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. And so, cool. so, <laughs> no, that I was just going to say, I, I appreciate you saying that and clarifying that. Mm -hmm. I think so many times when you um, talk football, I think a mm -hmm. lot of people can see it as like, oh gosh, you know, but no, it's just, this is, this is real life. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the NFL is actually grown men. I think a lot of times right. people try to act like college athletes are grown men just because they're getting paid. I don't subscribe yeah. to that. They are no. young men. They are learning. Let's leave right. them where they're at. These yeah. are actually grown men. There's nowhere yeah. else to go, but the NFL, you can't get higher than the NFL. This is the moment. Right. So it's time yep. to suck it up, accept all the feedback, close <laughs> yeah. your close your eyes and visualize being great and then go make it happen. Like this is grown That's men real. football we're talking about. Like we're That's not going to hold your hand. We'll cheer you on, but we're not going to hold your hand. Go out there and do what you can do. Like yep. be better. Um, well, cool. I will end this on you. If you have anything else that you want to say, JJ, about the Panthers or anything. I just appreciate your time and talking to mm -hmm. me and sharing um, really like a, a well-versed information, because like I said, I could, I could talk about people's teams for hours because I'm so yeah. fascinated with yeah. other people's stories and other people's experiences um, and how we all are kind of similar and how we all interweave and we all want our teams to win. We all want our teams to be great, but we also realize like if we suck, we suck and let's talk about why we suck. <laughs> so, yeah. so I appreciate that about NFL fans. I feel like NFL fans do that better than, than a lot of sports. No, I mean, and, and I appreciate you, you know, giving me time on your platform, you know, to to share my passion for football and for the Carolina Panthers. Um, you know, I'll leave you with this about the Carolina Panthers. You know, it's just a fun fact or two. Um, a lot of people from the outside look in, you know, looking in, they think that the Carolina Panthers are like a North Carolina team, right? You know, or, you know, just a team that's, you know, based in Charlotte, which is in North Carolina. Um, but a lot of people who follow football, they've never been to the Carolinas, right? That's plural. Yeah. And um, Charlotte, North Carolina sits just north of the border of South Carolina, right? Okay. And so, um, I mean, you could throw a rock from South Carolina and hit Charlotte. <laughs> um, and, that, and that's not hyperbole. Like, you can literally I'm going to find something for you while you're telling the yeah. story. So go and so, uh, <laughs> And so because... It's the Carolina Panthers. The Carolina Panthers is a team that's always been dedicated and focused to both states, right? And so the local fans know that, but even some of them deny it. But for the, you know, for your listeners around the NFL, um, it's for the whole region. It's for both states. You know, the original owner, um, you know, he was intent on giving the region an NFL football team uh, to support. And it has ties to it has ties to both. North Carolina and South Carolina. He went to college in South Carolina. Um, and so I just think, you know, for outside fans, NFL fans, I think it's important for them to know that that the team is really for both states and, you know, and, and the team is centrally located um, on the state line of both states. So that's that's factoid number one. And then um, ironically, if you're a college football fan, you know, for 29 years, the Carolina Panthers have existed. And never once have they drafted a player from Clemson, South Carolina, which is just an hour and a half away from Charlotte, right? And so um, I think that's an interesting, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting fact because Clemson has been really, really good for like the last decade almost. And um, the Carolina Panthers, for some reason, have never drafted a player from Clemson University. They drafted a plethora of players from University of South Carolina, players from NC State, uh, University of North Carolina. Um, I wonder and, and why. We can't figure it out. Right? We cannot figure it out. You know, it's, it's like the greatest mystery. I, I personally believe it must be something in the original bylaws, you know, that was drafted by the owner. 
And for some reason, he had some clips and hate, and he was like, we cannot draft a, like, nope. a player from that university. But 29 years, seven rounds of the draft, and never drafted one guy from Clemson, South Carolina, and have drafted multiple guys. I mean, I, I forget the actual number, but across the years, we drafted all kinds of guys from the University of South Carolina, um, but both bit schools in the state of South Carolina, and South Carolina is my home state. And everybody who's been watching football would know that Clemson has had better teams and players than the yeah. University of South Carolina, but the Carolina Panthers have yeah. not picked one in its history to date. Huh. Interesting fact. So. I just want to show you my, uh, do you know what you're looking at? Uh, you're, <laughs> you're in Carolina. I am. <laughs> so, I went to go see. So this is when Cam Newton was there. You'll probably, you can yeah. see a Luke Keekley jersey. If you look close, you'll see, uh, you see Cam like at the far side over here with his towel over his head. At the, look on the field and go okay. back. And, yeah. So I think I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I so I was, do. I was there. Oh my gosh, I don't even know how long ago it was but um I, I that's what i used to do i used to travel to, and like go to football games at stadiums um oh, yeah. and i i'll never forget when i went to charlotte i stayed yeah. at i think it was like a courtyard marriott downtown i mm -hmm. walked over to like the shopping center thing and i had some food at the food court and then there was a i will never forget this there was a, a water fountain i don't know if it's still there it was like this big water fountain would have this, it was a black wall, but it had water coming down. Mm -hmm. um, is it still there? I don't, I don't know. I okay. know the area. You're so, about, but I can't, I can't. Recall. Yeah. And so I'll never forget. It was, I sat there for probably four hours and it was just yeah. the water coming down and it was this black and nothing was happening. I wasn't, I was kind of people watching also yeah. kind of just like taking a deep breath and also just like, enjoying being outside and whatever, but I'll just never forget everybody that walked past me said hello to me. <laughs> so you got that Southern hospitality. Yeah. Was and I was like, yeah, every, I mean, I was, I had to have been, it was at least cause by the time I looked at my clock, I was like, Oh my, it was late. And I was yeah. close to the hotel. I, I could just walk back, yeah. but I just, I remember sitting there in my Steelers gear. I, I have a picture yeah. of it somewhere. I couldn't find it. And I just sat there and literally almost Everyone that walked by gave me either the head nod, a wave, anything. And I just always was like, this has been the best place ever. I actually got to the game that night and I went and bought merch. Um, wow. Because. I, merch. Yeah. And, and I laughed. My dad was like, why did you? And I was like, because no, I travel to games often. That was yeah. the first time any opposing team saw me in my, and I had a yellow shirt on and you saw the hat, yeah. like black hat. Yeah. Yeah. And they were love, like, they, it was like, they were just excited that I would even like come and show up. <laughs> and uh, you know, it was, it was amazing. And I thought I'm, I'm giving my money to these people. Like this is the, so anyways, like you know, that's, that's, that's an interesting story because um, it kind of lends to what I felt in 2014. Right. So again, Grew up a 49ers fan. Um, and, you know, I had always, you know, supported the Carolina Panthers, you know, as the team that I saw born and, you know, close to home and all that stuff. And and so in 2013 season, but the playoffs, January 2014, um, the the Carolina Panthers um, were matched up against the 49ers, right, in Charlotte. And so I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. And so um, I told my wife, I said, we're going to drive down to Charlotte from D.C. And I'm going to my first playoff game because I can't lose. That's my can't lose game. Yeah. And now they're facing each other in the playoffs. Right. So I was like, it doesn't matter what it costs. It doesn't matter how long it takes to get there because I can't lose this game. But yeah. I actually showed up to that game. First time ever being at Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. um, and so I showed up to that game. You know, with my cabinet jersey on, right? You know, so I, I didn't have any Panthers jersey at the time, and so I was like, okay, I'm here, right? And so obviously, I'm there. You know, I'm repping the 49ers, but I really don't care who wins. I just think it's gonna be cool for whoever advances, right? But I, I probably was leaning 49ers at the time, to be honest. But 
I had gone to San Francisco earlier that year and that season. And uh, and like I said, San Francisco was great, you know, great experience. But the game experience, I really felt kind of flat because I really didn't feel like those were my people, right? No, it yeah. But but I'm from I'm from the 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 Carolinas region, you know, from 30, yeah. 30, well not 30, but an hour, an hour south of Charlotte, right? So I um I'm I'm there, I get out the car, you know, I walk, you know, the streets kind of like you. I smell the food, I smell the barbecue, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm speaking to people, I'm speaking to fans from both teams. I go to the stadium. Uh, and I'm sitting beside, and I didn't know this, but I just happened to sit to be sitting right beside, you know, two very distinguished fans, right? And I didn't know that until we started talking. Hmm. And, you know, speaking to those gentlemen, you know, them telling me about, you know, their wives, you know, being a fan. Um, you know, they were locals and, you know, and then, you know, just the interactions I was having with local fans, they weren't even all good because <laughs> when the game didn't go their way, they got really mad and wanted to fight, you know, but, uh, but it didn't matter. Though. It didn't matter. The you know, but the fandom. <laughs> I, I, res I, yeah, I respected it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Cause I was like, I kind of like your passion. You know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. you ain't gonna beat me up, but I kind of like your passion. <laughs> um, and, but I felt like they were my people. Right. And I was like, and I actually felt bad leaving the stadium because, you know, those are your this people. Season had just ended, but I felt bad because I felt like my people's season had ended, and I was walking out of there with the winning jersey on, but I didn't feel like a winner, right? Yeah. And that was kind of the beginning of the transition that ultimately happened in 2018. You know, when Eric Reed went there. It, that yeah. it made it easy because I had already felt the emotion of being there and being amongst my people. And like, you know, what you experienced, um, the South isn't perfect. You nope. know, the Carolinas aren't perfect. <laughs> Listen, I'm in but Texas. People, it's not perfect. <laughs> I know. But, but the people haven't lived in Texas as well. Yeah. You know, we sweet just like the tea. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, no, it is. And it's so, you can't it's, beat. You can't buy it. It's you can't. Yeah, you can't. You can't replicate it anywhere else mm -hmm. in the country. Um, Alabama's by the closest it gets to the Carolinas in terms of just people being naturally hospitable. Um, so it's been very, very, very fulfilling. Um, dedicating 100 percent of my fandom to Carolina, um, even though we've sucked, you know, like the entire <laughs> time. You know, like I can't imagine. I can't imagine pulling for anybody else now because now I really feel like I'm with my people. And, yeah, uh, no, I got that, you. Just like, just like family, just like, you know, you don't necessarily like like everybody in your family, you know, but you love them because yeah, your your, those are your, those, again, it's your people. And you know what? Yeah. I, I want to end this episode yeah. um, by saying, first of all, um, I appreciate the journey that's gotten you here mm -hmm. because I think it's fans like you that these are that's the type of fan we really all should be um a purpose mm -hmm. a commitment and mm -hmm. be supportive you know what being yeah. supportive doesn't mean that you can't see when you suck being supportive doesn't mean you can't say when things aren't good being support like that's support is actually being honest with me i always say my closest people the people who i love the most the people i would literally trust with my life are the mm -hmm. people that would walk up to me and be bluntly honest with me even when I don't want to hear it because they know that it's going to make me better. And I, I wish more sports fans realized that it is okay. It's okay. Sometimes it isn't good actually. You know, and it's, it's, crazy. it's crazy. You say that because somebody who has a very cool position with the Panthers DM me. Right. <laughs> And was like, okay, at this point, we, I know. we all, after yeah, yeah. I end this, I need to have another conversation with you I know, about something. I know, but, but, but he said this, he said, he said, you know, hey, look, man, you know, I, li I love your content. And I was kind of like embarrassed a little bit because I can be negative. <laughs> You're time, honest. Right? Yeah, I was, I'm, I'm honest. I was like, look, I said, I said, I appreciate that. Um, I said, a lot of times I just have to like, you know, speak my mind. And I hope that's not offensive to you guys. And he was like, nope, it keeps us honest. That's it. That's it. I, that's and it. I, I was like, yeah, that's you know, like, and, and yeah, that's and what if I you don't want do. me to keep you honest, I don't want you in my life because you won't keep me honest. 
So what right. are we doing? You know? Right. So, right. well, good. I, I'm happy. For, I, I, I've just, I love this conversation. I feel there's certain things in life that I do where I constantly revert back to them and kind of re-listen. I feel like this episode, it's probably going to be my longest episode, but <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. No, like I, I told you before this, I enjoy good dog dialogue. I enjoy a good conversation. I enjoy talking to people that know things I don't know because I get educated on what's happening. Um, and that's what makes this journey fun for me. And so you will be one of 32, but I will be able to come back and go like, what did, I, wait, we were talking about something. What did he say? Yeah. And so yeah. I like that. I'll always have the moment to go back to. So thank you for coming on. Thank you. I feel like we'll find a way to collaborate on something else. Cause I'm sure something else will come up and I'm like, I need your opinion on something. Um, so I just appreciate you and just thank you for trusting a random person in your DMS. And thank you for being um, legit, you know, thank you for, you know, giving me an opportunity. Uh, I don't do, you know, my own podcast throughout the year, stuff like that. So, um, I like to keep it authentic and real, you know, but, you know, I know I'm not for everybody. Right. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate the ones who rock with me. And um, and I just like to have these opportunities to kind of like share with I share what I know. And um, because the only desire I had is to have a voice in fandom. Right. And so love that. And whatever Having medium a voice I in use, fandom. that's I just want a voice. I want I want the broader fan base to look at people who look like me and you and listen to what we have to say and respect it because it's founded and it's grounded and it's authentically us. Mm -hmm. All fans don't look the same. All mm -hmm. fans can't even afford to go to games, right? Facts. Mm -hmm. But they have feelings about who these teams are, how they build themselves and who they have representing them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I want them to know how we feel about the sport that we love just like yeah. they get to express it right i love that so, i'm ending there yeah. right. <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs>